Hi guys. Creating the perfect car setup in F1 2020 can be a daunting task. There are a lot of options and it isn't always clear which option affects your car in a certain way and especially which order you should adjust your setup. In this video, I'll run you through my method of setting up a car. I'll show you the overall order that I set up my own car, along with what I look for when making setup changes in F1 2020. Before I go any further, there is ultimately only one rule when it comes to adjusting your car setup in F1 2020 and that is only change one thing at a time. I recommend only changing one individual setup option at a time because if you change multiple setup options at once, you won't necessarily know which setup option was the one that ultimately affected how your car handled. This will make it hard to make future setup adjustments going forwards. When you first dedicate some time to creating an optimized setup, you need to have in mind your ultimate goal. Are you creating a setup for the fastest one lap in time trial mode? Or are you aiming for the most optimized race setup? Having this in your head at the start will really help you narrow down your intended results and focus on achieving your own goals. In this video, I'm going to run through as I'm creating a long distance race setup. So my main goals would be to have a stable and consistent car setup with optimal tyre wear and as much speed as I can. I'd always recommend working on your own car setups during a practice session opposed to time trial mode. This is because in time trial, everything is set to optimum. Track grip, tyre temps, overall performance, it's all set to the highest setting. This will make your car handle very differently to how it handles during a race session. During a practice session, you should look for optimal and consistent weather conditions to give you the best baseline possible. So jumping right into the setup options, when I first approach any new setup, there are a few setup options which I change with confidence before I even step out on track. Elements such as brake pressure and brake bias get changed to roughly 98% and 52%. And then I also crank down the on throttle diff setting to around 60%. These are setup options which are very consistent across every car on track in F1 2020. This will give me a car which breaks how I expect it to and isn't too lively under acceleration. As with all options, these three settings are still open to be adjusted throughout the process and certainly aren't set in stone. Once I've made my initial setup adjustments above, I then take to the track for the first time. All other setup options, other than the three above, remain at default or in this case, the balance setup. My goal on the first few runs are to dial in the best tyre pressures before moving on to the camber and then the toe. In reality, the tyre pressures and suspension geometry are heavily linked. All of the setup options in the tyres and suspension geometry have an effect on your tyre temperature and ultimate tyre wear. Incorrect suspension geometry can have an effect on your optimal tyre pressure setting. But let's focus on one element at a time. I'd recommend driving out on a setup with medium tyres or hards if you want to drive a longer run. And while you're driving around, ensure you have your temperature HUD active on your MFD. You can do this by scrolling through the MFD normally located behind the B button on Xbox or circle button on PS4. The main thing you should be looking for in regards to tyre temps is whether any tyre is overheating. If your tyre overheats during a race consistently, it will cause excess wear and a loss in performance. The main culprits causing excess tyre wear are high tyre pressures, Excess loads, such as fast long corners, similar to turn one and two at Suzuka, and aggressive suspension geometry. You should be aiming to set up your tyre pressures as high as you can get away with while not overheating the tyre and not getting too much wheel spin under acceleration. In F1 2020, this is typically quite low. Almost all of my race setups have low tyre pressures. While driving around, you should try and avoid any single tyre exceeding 100 degrees Celsius. Anything over this and your tyre will wear at an increased rate. Remember that you generally require a few laps before your tyres reach their average temperature, so all runs should be around 4 or 5 laps. Once you've completed a run, take note of which tyre overheats and whether you're getting excess wheel spin under acceleration. Then in the setup options, lower the pressure of any tyre which overheats consistently. You should also lower your rear tyre pressures a click or two if you're getting excess wheel spin. Once you've made tyre pressure changes, drive out for a second run and see whether all tyre temperatures are within an acceptable range. Keep making small adjustments as required until you feel happy with your tyre temps. As you'll see with these laps which I'm driving, I'm not driving flat out, I'm trying to drive consistently to get sort of a consistent feedback pattern. Once you're happy with the tyre pressures, we can move swiftly on to your camber and toe. Again, these setup options will also affect your tyre temperature and wear rate. So once you've adjusted your camber and toe, I'd recommend completing one final pass on your tyre temperatures just to ensure you haven't compromised your tyre pressure setup. Camber and toe can both be tricky to understand at first, 
especially given that F1 2020 doesn't do a great job explaining camber due to its confusing min-max labels. Ultimately, the lower the camber number, or the further left it is on the scale and closer to minus 3.5, the more the top of your tyres are leaning towards your car. This is good for ultimate mid-corner grip, however, the closer to minus 3.5 you go, the more tyre wear you'll be susceptible to. This is because the tyre has less contact patch with the road, meaning more stress is being put through a smaller part of the tyre, wearing it out faster. In F1 2020, generally, the closer you set up your camber to minus 2.5, which is furthest right on the scale, the faster your car will be, and the better your tyre wear will also be. This gives you the largest tyre contact patch with the road, distributing heat evenly and giving you maximum traction. However, if there are longer sweeping corners, you want to kind of move away from that minus 2.5 sector and somewhere in the middle should be good. Just remember that the further left you go, the more your tyres will wear. Your toe, on the other hand, dictates how straight your tyres are pointing. Run more toe and the front of your tyres will be pointing further out from your car. This gives you a more responsive car at the expense of excess drag and tyre wear. We'd recommend initially setting your camber all the way right and your toe all the way left for your first run on track. For the majority of tracks, this setup is pretty much the way to go, but if you are confident with your tyre temperatures, you can start to move your camber bar further left. This will allow you to take corners with more speed, but will increase tyre temps and give you less ultimate traction in a straight line. In terms of the toe, the lower the better generally. The lower the toe setup is, the more stable your car will be. Increasing both front and rear toe will make your steering feel lighter, and increased rear toe will also help your car rotate at a slower speed. The main downside of higher toe settings are excess drag. As your tyres are effectively pointing away from your car, they drag across the track more rather than driving the car straight forward. This effect will compromise your top speed slightly, but more importantly, will cause excess tyre temps. Once you've set up your camber, toe and tyre pressures, run another five lap test to check on your tyre temperatures. Make any final tweaks required to optimise your pressures before moving on to the next step. And that next step is, your anti-roll bars. These are responsible for dictating how much your car rolls or leans during turning, acceleration and deceleration. The softer your anti-roll bars, the more your car will roll, and the stiffer, the less it will roll. As a general rule of thumb, the stiffer your anti-roll bars are set, the more responsive your car will be during all inputs. This includes turning responsiveness, but also livens up your rear end, meaning your car will be prone to oversteering. The main negative about having stiff anti-roll bars are that they will introduce more tyre wear the stiffer you go. If you soften your anti-roll bars, your car will be more gentle on your tyres, meaning less wear and more grip. But your car will start to feel unresponsive and slow to turn in. Typically, most tracks will require slightly stiffer anti-roll bars, normally above 6, but sometimes right up to about 10 or 11. Another factor to think about when setting up your car for a certain track is the track's surface. If you're running on a bumpy track, Stiff anti-roll bars will cause your car to bounce off of those bumps, causing a lot of instability. Whereas if you're driving on a smooth, modern track, you can increase your stiffness a touch. We would recommend you start to increase your anti-roll bars a couple of points at a time. With your rear anti-roll bars, set a few points above your front. Keep doing this until the car starts to feel too twitchy or you feel too much oversteer. Again, once you've implemented any anti-roll bar changes, keep an eye on your tyre temps to account for any excess wear you've built in. Just to reiterate, when we're testing this setup on track, we're not trying to put in flat out lap times. Instead, just drive consistently, a little bit under your maximum, just to get consistent feedback. The main thing to look out for here, up until now, is how well and stable your car is behaving. We want to try and dial out as much oversteer as we can, as much understeer as we can, and keep our tyre temperatures down. Once you've dialed in optimal tyre wear, and set up your chassis to behave in the way that you want it to. The next step is to dial in your aero, as this will be a big factor when it comes to overall lap time. Ultimately, you want to run as little aero as you can get away with. The lower your aero, the faster you'll be in a straight line. However, you will be compromising some of your corner grip and speed. Typically, most circuits will require a higher rear downforce setup and lower front. The rear doesn't cause as much drag as the front aero does, and it will be beneficial when trying to maintain mid-corner speed. So one of the first changes you should make is to lower the front by a couple of points or alternatively raise the rear by a couple of points to create that offset. Then either lower or raise both the front and rear aero in tandem to suit the track you're driving. A 
A fast circuit, such as Monza or Spa, will typically require lower downforce, while slower, more technical tracks like Monaco will require much higher aero. As mentioned, the goal is to lower your aero as much as you can get away with, without losing speed through the corners. Generally, it's more beneficial to run slightly lower downforce than slightly higher. If you set too much downforce, you'll be feeling the pain all through the race, as you'll be slow on all of the straights. If you're experiencing too much understeer, you can adjust your front wing up a little, and too much oversteer, increase your rear aero. Only make small adjustments, but keep going until you feel comfortable driving the car. Also, this is the part where you should keep an eye on your lap times, as they'll go up and down as you make adjustments. You can easily fall into the trap of setting your aero too high, because high aero will almost always make your car feel nicer to drive. So just keep an eye on your lap times and try and find the fastest and still comfortable aero balance you can. The final options you should address are your suspension options. I'd recommend starting with your ride height before moving on to your overall suspension stiffness. The goal with ride height is to lower it as much as you can before you start to encounter grounding or bottoming out. This is where the bottom of your car scrapes along the road. I'll demonstrate that here quickly by setting my ride height to one and one. And you can see as I drive over the curb, the car just becomes skittish and I lose all control. You'll also be able to hear this along a straight. If your car is bottoming out on the ground as you drive down a straight, you'll hear it scraping. Typically, you'll want a slightly higher rear ride height compared to the front, which is called rake. Adding rake to your setup in F1 2020 does slightly increase drag, but will help produce more mechanical downforce, which is great for the corners. So offset your ride height by one point with the front lower than the rear. Then start lowering it until you start to feel and hear your car bottoming out. As soon as you feel the road, you've gone too far, so bump it back up a little. If your car is feeling overly twitchy over bumps or unstable, you can always increase the ride height a little to fix this. Once you've achieved a good ride height setup, we can move straight onto our suspension stiffness. As a general rule of thumb in F1 2020, you'll want to run a soft suspension setup. Quite often the quickest way around any track is to really attack the kerbs and maximize your corner exit by driving over runoff areas. To do this effectively without unsettling your car too much, you'll want a soft suspension setup. Again, a good rule of thumb is to offset your suspension stiffness with the front one or two points softer than the rear. This will help your car remain stable when you hit curves with your front axle. I'd recommend lowering both front and rear suspension to the point where you can attack curves consistently. If you start to feel the car becoming a little twitchy or too lively over curbs and bumps, soften both front and rear suspension a little more until it becomes drivable. And that covers our general setup routine. Of course, once you've reached the end of this process and have set up all aspects of your car, there's almost certainly still lap time to be found. You can do this by analyzing how your car feels as you drive, then adjusting certain individual elements ever so slightly. If you feel an improvement after each adjustment, keep it. If you don't, switch it back and try a different approach. However, when creating a race setup, just be constantly mindful of your tire wear. This is one of the most important areas to optimize for race runs. There are a couple of areas which I didn't actually touch on in this, including the brake setup and the off throttle diff. All of these settings are generally okay to leave, especially once you made the initial brake changes at the beginning. However, just take note of how your car behaves, as you can slightly adjust your brake pressure up and down to account for locking or your brake bias forward or backwards. And with the off throttle diff, the higher you go, the more rotation you'll get at slower speeds, but just try not to go too high. If you're not sure about the setting, generally leave it about 65 and you can get away with that on most tracks. Once you feel happy with your setup, why not jump into a quick race to test the setup out across a longer race distance and against the AI? As soon as you start following the AI, you'll also quickly realize areas of the track where you're either fast or slow. This can help you make further setup adjustments. For example, if you're too slow in the straights, you can jump back into the setup and reduce your aero a little. But hopefully, this video has helped you run through the process of actually creating a setup from scratch in F1 2020. If this video has helped you out, please give this video a like as it will really help the channel grow. And why not subscribe for more F1 2020 and sim racing content. See you on track guys. DRS is now enabled.
front is 1.5 seconds. Teammate by 4.2 seconds.